Bradford, and I am one of the peds anesthesia attendings at the University of Kentucky. Today we're going to be talking about monitoring standards and inspired oxygen monitoring. So I do not have any relevant disclosures in the last 12 months or any really. Our objectives will be to understand the standards for basic anesthetic monitoring as defined by the ASA. We'll talk about the situations where these standards apply. We'll also talk about the difference between the terms continuous and continual. We'll talk about potential causes of a low FiO2 alarm. And we'll talk about some examples where situations clinically you may need invasive monitoring. So continual versus continuous. Continual means we're repeating regularly and frequently in steady rapid succession. So this would be like a blood pressure cuff going up every three minutes. Continuous is prolonged without any interruption at any time. So if you're watching blood pressure using an arterial line, for example, that's the difference. ASA monitoring standards. So number one, qualified anesthesia personnel shall be present in the room throughout the conduct of all general anesthetics, regional anesthetics, and monitored anesthesia care. So continuously present. So nobody leaves without somebody else coming in. Someone is always with the patient. If there's a hazard to anesthesia personnel, for example, radiation, you can do remote observation where there's a camera pointed at the patient, camera pointed at your monitors, or you turn your monitors like an MRI where we just sit right outside the door. Um, in an emergency, it is up to the attending anesthesiologist to decide who will be responsible for the patient. And this comes up, for example, when you're doing um, a spinal anesthetic for a c-section and potentially you're asked to help um, resuscitate the neonate and you know you can designate someone to watch the mother while you help with that these standards are not intended for the application to care of the patient the obstetrical patient in labor so if a patient just has an epidural placed for continuous infusion for relief of labor pain does not mean you have to have someone sit in the room the entire time until she delivers and the epidural needs to come out or in the conduct of pain management. During all anesthetics, the patient's oxygenation, ventilation, circulation and temperature shall be continually evaluated. So in regular frequent intervals so oxygenation, we're using inspired gas, measuring um, inhaled fraction of oxygen analyzer with a low oxygen concentration limit alarm and pulse oximity, oximetry to measure blood oxygenation with variable pitch tone. So there's a difference between the sound at 99% versus 97 versus 94. And low pulse ox alarms should be audible because we all know the operating room can be a noisy place. Inspired oxygen monitoring. So we don't want to give hypoxic gas mixture. Um, the oxygen analyzer must be calibrated to room air. Um, it's going to sample the inspiratory limb and reasons that you may get a low oxygen alarm or if there's a pipeline crossover if an oxygen tank is filled with the wrong gas, or if the proportioning system fails. So that's the part on the anesthesia machine that's designed to deliver at least 25% oxygen, and that proportioning system is also why when you turn up the nitrous, the oxygen also increases. However, you can potentially deliver a hypoxic mixture if there's a mix-up in the wall oxygen supply, so not even before the machine, 
and you connect a nasal cannula to the auxiliary port because you're not sampling the inspiratory limb, this can still happen. The three types of oxygen monitor are fuel cell, paramagnetic, and oxygraphy. So this is just what the fuel cell and the paramagnetic look like. So the fuel cell is one that has to be calibrated. This piece is taken out and exposed to room air for a couple of minutes, and that's how it knows what 21% oxygen is. Um, oxygen in the sample will permeate a membrane, and it enters potassium hydroxide elect electrolyte solution that generates the potential between a lead anode and a noble metal cathode as the oxygen is supplied. This measured voltage um, between the electrodes is proportional to the oxygen tension in the sample. The paramagnetic oxygen analyzer has a sample and a reference gas streams that converge along a magnetic field. Um, because the two streams have different oxygen tensions, meaning different numbers of oxygen molecules, this creates a pressure differential across the magnetic transducer. The transducer converts that to an electrical signal that is then uh, displayed to you. Oxygraphy is laser spectroscopy, so a laser is turned uh, 760 nanometers. As the oxygen increases, that intensity of light changes. So for um, further monitoring standards, ventilation must be continually evaluated. So end tidal carbon dioxide is a must unless it's invalidated by the nature of the patient procedure or the equipment with an audible alarm. You have to have a disconnect alarm on the ventilator. And in regional or local with no sedation, just evaluate qualitative signs. So that's like watching chest rise, auscultating. Um, quantitative signs are quantities, numbers. So the end tidal CO2, is that 35, 45, 55? Um, we do need to look at end tidal CO2 for moderate and deep sedation. That is the same as for general anesthesia. For circulation, we want to look at EKG from beginning of the anesthetic to preparing to leave the room, blood pressure at least every five minutes, and continual evaluation of pulse by palpation, auscultation, intraarterial pressure, ultrasound peripheral pulse, pulse plethysmography, or oximetry. When we're monitoring body temperature, that's when it's clinically significant changes are intended, anticipated, or suspected. So if you deviate from any of these monitoring standards, you have to document why. So did you not put a temperature probe on um, because it's uh, maybe a five-minute ear tube case, and we don't anticipate any real changes in temperature? Or is it um, that maybe your institution doesn't have an MRI-safe temperature probe, so you can't use it, and, um, you know, you just write, we're monitoring, patient was covered with warm blankets, and no MRI-safe probe available. So you have to document if these standards are not going to be followed, and why? Is it because of the patient, the procedure, the equipment, etc.? So invasive monitoring arterial lines and central lines, this gives you the ability to watch on the arterial line pulse pressure variation, um, which can give you a clue on how fluid responsive the patient will be and help you differentiate potentially causes of 
hypotension? Is it because of hypovolemia or um, acute bleeding versus a patient's own cardiac disease? Uh, central venous pressure and the decision to place these can all be um, based on patient characteristics, the need for drug delivery. Um, do you need inotropes or other vesicants that can't be delivered through a peripheral line? Or a need for rapid transfusion in a case where you anticipate a lot of blood loss, like a liver transplant, and the type of operation, uh, depending on what kind of access you're going to have may change where you put your lines. Another reason might be if the patient, um, their own disease process, either trauma, cardiac, lung disease, requires this even if the, the operation or the procedure itself is not that invasive, um, potentially a very obese patient where a blood pressure cuff is unreliable and they're planning to tuck the arms. So you may place an arterial line just to get a reliable blood pressure in that patient as well. So just looking at some board review, um, we're going to talk about this first question. These are from open anesthesia. A patient is undergoing a 10-hour craniotomy. The ABG is as follows, pH 7.35, PCO2 25, PO2 183, bicarb 17 with a base deficit of minus 9, electrolytes sodium 142, potassium 3.9, chloride 115, CO2 17, BUN 24, and creatinine 1.1. So how can we explain these findings and what's going on? So what we're seeing here is a hyperchloremic acidosis. Our anion gap is that our first option is 10. So that's the sodium 142 minus the bicarb, the sum of the bicarb and the chloride. So that's 115 plus 17. That's going to be 132. 142 minus 132 is 10. 10 is less than 12, so that tells us it's not an anion gap acidosis. That also removes lactic acidosis as a correct answer, because that is, if you remember back to mud piles, mnemonic, that's a anion gap acidosis. So what we're really seeing here, we also have hyperchloremia, is likely dilution of the patient's bicarbonate, decreased bicarbonate reabsorption due to volume expansion from a large volume of sodium chloride containing IV solution. Um, and this can happen during a long case. Typically, um, normal saline is used as opposed to lactated ringers in neurosurgical cases. So this is a situation that you may come our own another board review case question from open anesthesia a diabetic patient with chronic renal disease is having a ct scan which of the following will most likely reduce the risk of contrast induced nephropathy in this patient bicarbonate infusion insulin mannitol furosemide or Lasix. So the most important step in prevention of contrast nephropathy is limiting risk factors. So for example, hypovolemia and high doses of contrast dye. Um, the patient is already at risk being diabetic and having chronic renal disease. Some randomized control trials have concluded that mannitol and furosemide actually increase the risk of contrast-induced nephropathy, so we wouldn't use those to prevent it. Um, 
Bicarb, sodium bicarb, is commonly used to help prevent contrast nephropathy. The theoretical benefit being that there is decreased acidification of the urine and renal medulla, which may reduce the free radical injury caused by the contrast. Basically, the big idea of prevention of contrast nephropathy is risk stratification, IV hydration with normal saline or sodium bicarbonate, um, withholding toxic nephrotoxic medication, using low or isoosmolar contrast media, and changing uh, intraprocedural methods for the actual iodinated contrast dose reduction. So our correct answer is. So thank you for your attention. And these are my references that you can look up. The first is the guidelines from the ASA, um, then a textbook on anesthesia equipment and openanesthesia.org for the review questions. If you have any questions, please email me, victoria.bradford at uky.edu. Thanks again. Have a great day.